I'm 86 and still working full time in Saturday afternoons when Rhonda's interviewing me. But um, I hope I'll live to 90, but who knows? But I have some big ideas I'm trying to get out there before I kick off. This is not a presentation of new research, but rather a farewell greeting and a summary of my most recent thoughts that guided my research. I thought it would be interesting to go over the zigzagging process by which my most recent ideas came about. I started my research career as a very distractible undergraduate student at Cornell University in Ithaca, New York, with a passion for biochemistry and genetics, getting a good background in chemistry and a love for folk dancing and reading history and classical literature. I also had, um, as it's always been with me, a lot of enthusiasm, curiosity, and reliance on my intuition. As part of my studies at Caltech for my PhD, I honed my skills in genetics, biochemistry, and enzymology, which proved fundamental in the course of all the following many years of my research. My study of the genetic, enzymological, and regulatory aspects of the large and complicated histidine biosynthetic pathway in salmonella in the 1960s and 70s led me to the development of what I began as a hobby, the AIMS test for mutagens. This launched me in collaboration with Lois Gold into the parallel field of comparing mutagenic potency with carcinogenic potency and putting in perspective the possible cancer hazard of synthetic chemicals, such as pesticide residues, versus that due to the much more abundant natural mutagenic and carcinogenic chemicals found in the diet. In the 1990s, I became interested in the connection between DNA damage and cancer, inflammation and oxidative damage from naturally generated oxygen radicals, and the regulation of antioxidant defenses, which led to further thoughts about unbalanced diets and micronutrient deficiency being a major contributor to cancer. A fellow named Jim McGregor came to my lab on sabbatical. He's a cytogeneticist, and he was studying what happens when mice get irradiated. You break chromosomes. He was treating mice with radiation and looking at various things that uh, affected that. And one day, all his control mice were full of chromosome breaks. And he said, what's going on? And he tracked it down to the company that sold him the vitamin mix, had by mistake left folic acid out of the vitamin mix. And so he did a dose response in folic acid. And the less folic acid the mice got, the more chromosome breaks. And one pathway that folic acid is involved with is putting one carbon units into DNA and into RNA. So it's involved with nucleic acid synthesis. Um, anyway, it all made mechanistic sense. We understood how it was working. And uh, one of my students and one of Fennec's students uh, compared radiation to folate deficiency. So it was a pretty solid case. One of the things we found is I looked in the literature, put in the, Google is wonderful now, you put in the 30 vitamins and minerals, you need 30 different substances uh, to run your metabolism. They're cofactors for enzymes mostly. And if you don't get any one, you die. But the criteria for calling something of a vitamin is that the mice, mice die or people die or get scurvy or beriberi or some horrible disease. But when I asked about DNA damage, lots of deficiencies cause that. And I kept on wondering, why is nature doing that? Why is it breaking your chromosomes or damaging your DNA when you don't get enough? And one day it hit me and I got, this theory came into my head it's just what nature wants, is that when, when you get a little low on any vitamin or mineral, it's in nature's benefit to ration it. And so the way it rations it, where would you expect, if you don't have an, enough selenium or vitamin K or magnesium or whatever, what's nature going to do? Well, it's going to put it into those proteins that say they're uh, 
25 selenium proteins or 16 vitamin K dependent proteins, it's going to put it into those proteins that are essential for survival because what nature wants you to do is survive and reproduce. That's strong selection. And living to 90, nature really doesn't care about you. So basically what nature is doing is trading long-term health for short-term health. So and it wants short-term survival. So anyway, I wrote a theoretical paper saying, hey, this is an interesting theory and has a lot of implication for human nutrition. And then later, Joyce McCann in my lab, came, she came into my office one day and said, I'm a little skeptical of your triage theory. I think there's a better way of attacking it. I said, Joyce, what do you want to do? Go to it. She's a really smart cookie. And she said, well, I'll research a couple of one vitamin and one mineral that have been well studied and see is tri this triage idea that there's a rationing really built in. I called it triage. Uh, and I said, terrific, Joyce, go to it. So she turned out two beautiful reviews, one on vitamin K and one on selenium. And they both have a system for rationing so that, for example, in vitamin K, the clotting proteins get it first. And only after they're satisfied do you do uh, prevent calcification of the arteries or prevent cancer or prevent uh, bone fractures. All these things are proteins that help, help in these things, but it's all insidious damage that you get that's a long-term consequence. In fact, we call those the disease of aging. Your brain so slowly goes out or your heart slowly goes out or your DNA gets damaged and you get cancer. And so she showed it's true for both of these systems. I referred to the class of proteins needed for short-term survival as survival proteins or essential proteins, while those that suffer from nutrient shortages as longevity proteins or non-essential proteins, because they normally defend against the diseases associated with aging. The theory implies that vitamins and minerals are needed for both short and long-term survival and also that such pathology is both measurable biochemically and remediable by appropriate supplementation and or an improved diet. A follow-up from the triage theory is a concept of longevity vitamins, which led me to suggest that 11 known metabolites are good candidates for being longevity vitamins. Many nutrients play a dual role for both survival and longevity. I used to teach a biochemistry lab for many years uh, where I, I had the students isolate mutants of bacteria that would grow on a complex medium and not on a simple medium. And each student had to pick three mutants and do a little detective work and figure out what gene was damaged. And it was good to make the students think, but one kind of mutant kept on cropping up, and mutants I called KM mutants that were, had to do with binding sites. And you've mutated the threonine deaminase, which has a paradoxal phosphate coenzyme, so that its binding for the paradoxal phosphate isn't very good. And if you put in high paradoxin, it can also make the enzyme work, and then you don't need the isoleucine. So it turns out you make a random mutation in the gene, you deform the protein, and if the protein has a coenzyme 20% of the time or whatever, you've affected the binding constant for the coenzyme, which means you've lost activity, but it turns out you can reverse it, huge levels of B vitamins, and raise coenzyme levels 10 or 20 times. Now, why nature made it that way, I don't know, but it's true of all the B vitamins, which means that you can reverse the phenotype. This finding raised two important questions. How common are these mutations? Do humans carry them? Can they be ameliorated by treatment with either the final product, an intermediate product, or the coenzyme? With the collaboration of two undergraduate students who had participated in my course, we researched the medical literature and wrote an integrated review which showed that many human diseases, 50 at the time of that research, were known to be due to a defect in enzymes requiring specific cofactors and were ameliorated by supplementation with high doses of the vitamin component of the relevant coenzyme.
The strategy was effective in some, but not all of the cases, and with various levels of remediation, which indicated that each partial defect in any specific gene is caused by a different protein modification, resulting in a variety of modified structural changes depending on the specific nature of each uh, mutation. The concept of inborn suboptimal functionality of parts of the metabolism led me to question whether nutritional deficiencies could have the same effects and not show up as an obvious disease. Might some individuals, though apparently normal, harbor a poorly functioning metabolic protein because of malnutrition, resulting in a relatively small change? Such an individual would not necessarily be aware of harboring any significant problem. Thus, such defects are not easily identifiable, plus they are dangerously insidious. Within this picture, mitochondria are particularly sensitive to damage with age, which is particularly acute in the mitochondrial membranes, presumably due to the presence of high levels of oxidants from lipid peroxidation and or adduction of aldehydes to lysine residues in mitochondrial proteins. So some years ago, Tori Hagen and Mark Shiganaga and I, we sat down and looked at what was the weak link, and we decided it was the mitochondria. Now, other people had come to the same conclusion. We thought we added a few insights, and it got us excited enough about it, we decided to work on it. And in the course of it, we got interested in carnitine, and some people in Bari, Italy, Gadoletta and Paradis, fed acetylcarnitine to old rats, and they said mitochondrial transcription got much better. So we had all these good methods, and we looked at that, and in fact, everything we measured in the mitochondria got better, except for one thing, the, the still spewing out oxygen radicals. So then we went back to the drawing board to find something that would be an antioxidant for mitochondria, and Lester Packer's been saying for years that lipoic acid is a terrific antioxidant. So we tried that, we fed old rats lipoic acid, and it was terrific. It lowered the level of oxidants down to the level of the young rat. And uh, in a fit of enthusiasm, I called up my son in New York, who works on computers, and I said, one of my students seem to be changing old rats into young rats. And my son replied, oh, that's all very well and good, but you let me know when you do the next step, when you change old people to young rats. The obese are eating the worst diet in the country because they're eating empty calories and not eating the greens and they're not e they don't eat much fish and all of that. But it's aging them much faster. And every possible disease that's been looked at is higher in the obese. More cancer, more brain decay, more heart disease, you name it. And if it's been looked at, it's higher in the obese. Right. And I think a lot of that's due to the fact that they're starving for vitamins and minerals. We invented something called the Cori Bar about 10 years ago, Mark Shiganaga and I. Just, he was an expert in the gut, and I wanted to get vitamins and minerals into the poor. So we came up with this bar. The local USDA was making a fruit bar, and we added vitamins to it, and our plant phenolics were in there, and a fiber, the three kinds of fiber you need to keep your gut healthy. And we've done 15 human clinical trials. Joyce McCann's running the project, so she should really talk about all of this. But she just sent off a fantastic paper which shows that this Cori bar, if you know what you're doing, the obese can lose weight. So I suspect it might affect satiety, that whether you're hungry or not, fiber is known to fill you up. And the obese are short of fiber. And I think it's going to make them feel good. 15 small clinical trials, which did not require a change in diet, demonstrated that the consumption of two quarry bars each day significantly increased HDL, particularly large HDL. Longer trials of about two months in overweight obese adults resulted in additional significant changes in the direction of decreased risk of future disease in both HDL and LDL lipid particle profiles, triglycerides, insulin resistance, and in addition, statistically stiff, significant decreases in weight, waist circumference, diastolic blood pressure, and heart rate. 
These results provided strong support for the concept that the key to reducing disease risk in all people is to restore a healthy metabolism. Vitamin D is a special one because that goes to a hormone. It's really more a hormone than a vitamin. And it's controlling a thousand genes, lots of them in your brain. So if you're vitamin D deficient, you're in deep trouble. And that has a lot to do with skin color because a dark skin prevents you getting UVB uh, radiation. That's the burning rays of the sun. And you know, you can get burnt if you get too much sunshine all at once. And in the tropics, you need a lot of melanin in your skin to keep UVB radiation out. So you need a dark skin to prevent getting fried by the sun. If you put an Irishman in Australia, they're in deep trouble. And the solution is a hat and sunscreen. And if you put an African-American in Chicago, they're in deep trouble because in a northern latitude, if you have a dark skin, you're in trouble. You're not making your vitamin D, and you need to do something about it. Eighty patients at Children's Hospital, where I work, came in with, the kids came in with rickets. They don't get straight bones. Well, rickets have been eliminated, but they were all African-American women who were nurse, nursing their babies, and they didn't have any vitamin D. Vitamin D levels are inadequate in 70% of the U.S. population and over 90% in African-Americans, where the prevalence of a serious deficiency of 10 nanograms per mil in a large percent of people of color living at northern latitudes. Vitamin D deficiency causes or has been associated with widespread health problems, a large number of which affect healthy aging with higher incidence or poor outcomes for many diseases, regardless of skin color particularly for things like complications of pregnancy, multiple sclerosis, dementia, type two diabetes, colorectal cancer, total cancer mortality, rickets, several neurobiological functions, acute respiratory tract infections, and now COVID-19. One of our purposes was to address more specifically the effects of vitamin D deficiency on the health parameters of people of color, especially those living at higher latitudes in the equatorial environment at which their dark skin color originally evolved, and provide suggestion as how to remedy the deficiency. So the last 10 or 15 years I've been in nutrition, and it's a wonderfully muddy field. It's just, a, I love being in a field like that. And there's not a lot of competition with people who have my kind of background in nutrition. Anyway, I think I've made a few contributions. Dr. Ames would like to express special thanks to all the undergrads, graduate students, postdocs, and colleagues without whom this research could not have been done. I would also like to thank Dr. Ames for sharing his story and his science with us. His scientific passions have inspired generations of scientists and will continue to inspire scientists for generations to come. If you wanna read more about Dr. Ames and the science he inspired, I encourage you to check out the upcoming issue organized by one of our later speakers today, uh, Dr. Zhang Kong Lu. Uh, Dr. Ames will be 93 years young this year, and in honor of Dr. Ames, a special issue honoring him will be published in the Journal of Free Radical Biology and Medicine. You can read more about Dr. Ames, uh, find more papers by some of his co-workers and lifelong friends, uh, people that he inspired.